Welcome to the Business Resilience Decoded podcast, brought to you by Asfalis Advisors and the Disaster Recovery Journal. Crisis management in today's world is ever-changing, and this podcast is our commitment to help you navigate successful outcomes for any crisis you may face. I'm your host, Vanessa Matthews. I specialize in providing insights and solutions for crisis, continuity, and resilience across industries from real estate and healthcare to terrorism in the airline and transportation worlds. No matter what industry you're in, this podcast will provide you the tools to build resilience in your organization. Welcome back to another episode of the Business Resilience Decoded podcast. Today, I'm super excited to be talking with Brian Kuhn. He is the Chief Operating Officer from InfraScale. But before we get started in our podcast, I'd like to share a few resilience resources and reminders with you. Number one, please be sure in Asfalis News, if you want to recommend someone to be a guest on the podcast, if you would like to download our five-step crisis strategy that you can use to navigate any business through any crisis in any industry, or if you would like to request me, your host, Vanessa Matthews, as a speaker for an upcoming program, you can find all of those links in the show notes for today's podcast. Secondly, for Disaster Recovery Journal News, if you would like to learn more about the webinars on Wednesdays, upcoming conferences, as well as the Disaster Recovery Journal, you can also check the show notes for those links. And lastly, if you enjoy our podcast, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. This helps us to find more listeners, and it also helps us to know that we're adding value to you. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guest today, Brian. Good to have you. Thank you very much for having me. (laughs) I'm excited. So the topic for today's episode is titled, What Does It Cost You to Ignore Data Protection? I spent some time looking up Brian and really loved the things that I saw in his background. And so I'd like to start with the first question. Can you tell us a little bit about your background and then specifically, how did you transition into the role of an operating officer? By accident, but not seriously. Um, Well, let me start with your question. Well, hello, everyone. Um, My name is Brian Kuhn. I am the chief operating officer at InfraScale, and I have been so for about two years now. My background and my journey didn't start in operations. It didn't start in business management. I'm actually a degree in computer science. And I started um, as an engineer, software engineer, um, and and more specifically, I guess, in IT. So my first big job out of college was actually working for Hewlett Packard. And um, at the time, um, and I'm not going to date myself too badly here, security uh, infrastructure was just really kind of getting to be a big thing. So running, um, the windows domain, uh, for all of the Hewlett Packard pre agilent pre split, um, oh, I just dated myself, um, companies, uh, was it so hundreds of thousands of end users that are worried about authentication and authorization controls. That is the starting and the origin of being an IT developer, IT programmer, or IT manager. Um, but I spent time in other companies after that doing consumer electronics uh, for Palm, the handheld company, learning there things like carrier relationships and learning about uh, consumer packaged goods and wireless communications. And this was, I am going to date myself, pre-Wi-Fi because we launched the first Wi-Fi devices uh, while, I were th- while I was there. Um, So having kind of a storied background and then moving on to companies like eBay, um, where I took a product management role um, and and stemmed, actually Palm is where I I, I switched professions, that came out of the point of, I'm the type of person who needs and requires detail. And as an engineer, you need to know what you're building. And I wasn't necessarily getting that. um, So I was creating my own requirements and I became the product manager for a lot of what I was working on. Um, And this is my foray then into this operational realm, right? Of of thinking, hey, what is it the business actually needs? How do I translate those business requirements? And then in this case, I was actually building them. Uh, So spent some time then at Palm, then some time at eBay. um, And this was in the uh, very early 2000s at eBay where it was just a product factory. A lot of really great knowledge that transpired there and learning about the right way to think about how do you and what product do you build for a consumer or a user of a website? How do you make it sticky? How do you make it frictionless? And more importantly, if you're going to spend all the time and the resources to build something, 
how do you know it will work? Um, so this was, uh, again, an introduction to more of the business and thinking through how do you make product decisions based on an NPV analysis and, and thinking about what are the right trade-offs for that cost and time and money. And, and as a product manager, I wasn't thinking too much of that, but as I evolved, and I'm gonna fast forward now in, in time, it's that foundational product and engineering background that finally, um, after spending time at uh, a travel and an expense company, and then uh, moving to a consumer search site um, uh, and decided, hey, it's time for me to go get an MBA. So this is the, hey, I've got this foundational element of engineering and some business and marketing contexts. Let me go do this, um, which then spawned to uh, some marketing functions um, and beyond marketing and, and working for web hosting company, where now I was worried about not only hosting, but the security around that. And at the time was really crazy thing to worry about for, uh, say, WordPress security, uh, thinking about managed services, how do you offer it? How do you optimize margins? So as you can see, my, my thinking started getting broader on the business lines ran some marketing capabilities uh, during the election cycle of 2016, uh, worked for a company that was doing polling and getting people to do frictionless engagement with their uh, elected officials. Um, and then back to a hosting company um, where I served uh, first as the chief product officer for the, 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 the company that was doing the civic engagement and then chief digital officer, which was product uh, and uh, marketing at the hosting company uh, and where I ultimately uh, found my way into a general management position. So how I get to the COO is eventually just taking these roles and building upon them, getting more breadth under my umbrella. Uh, so I, I call myself a jack of many trades, master of some, master of many. Well, I appreciate that. One for two things. Uh, shout out to Lisa from ACP Great Lakes chapter. Uh, we spent some time talking. She's a subscriber who literally reaches out to every single guest that we have. So go Lisa. And I asked her like, what do you love about the podcast? And she said, it's it's hearing the stories of, of the people that we interview and knowing your path, like where you came from, how you got here. Um, but the other reason why I really wanted to know about your path as an operator is I believe that in our role in resilience, and risk and crisis management and you know you know continuity we're here to protect the organization and quite frankly the operations is either the product or the service that you're delivering to a client and if you're not doing that then there is no business <laughs> and so we always work so closely with folks like yourselves in the operator role so um, thank you for sharing that overview this gives us a lot of perspective on how to navigate today's conversation and I'm from Michigan, so the Great Lakes connection is good. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> so, so look, I was thinking about before our podcast today, like what are my clients saying to me that I can ask Brian? So here we go. I'm a shoot. I hear clients and business leaders say, my technology is outdated. Mm -hmm. We don't have the internal expertise to fix it, whatever it is. Or we don't have the funding to upgrade our technology. And so what happens is they bypass the critical steps to protect their data. And so I wanted to know, in your experience, how do you help business leaders who are similar to our clients that might be facing some of these challenges? I'm going to answer this from the general point of view first, because you, you teed up my, my background. And I'm going to lean on product management here. Um, so product manager uh, is, is taking customer needs the business needs and the needs of the stakeholder and, and mashing them together. In this case, you've just teed me up with a question about a company that isn't investing in its technology or has outdated technology, doesn't have the money and doesn't have the expertise. And I would sit down with that company first and foremost to understand what is it that they do, right? What is it that the business is? And, and I'm going to frame this because Infrascale is a company focused on small and medium businesses. Let me start with that. Um, a lot of small and medium businesses are exactly in the situation that you just teed up. They have very limited funds. They're either mom and pop operations or truly small businesses, less than 10 people. Um, they have maybe a laptop in the corner or they've got their whole payroll or they've got their entire customer contact list. 
whatever it is that they've got, it's sitting on a sole source laptop or a sole source server. Uh, worse, if they've got an e-commerce site, they're not using some type of SaaS solution and they've got maybe do have some more information technology and they've got a web server and a database and something. E even that is subject to, and I'm talking to someone who knows all about resilience, but this is their data is sitting on some server, some laptop, some medium somewhere, and they have business processes sitting somewhere that now the problem is it's out of date. And that out of date can be many things, right? It could be, hey, I haven't upgraded SQL Server in ages. Hey, I'm running Windows 95, um, whatever it is, that technology is there. And then I don't know what to do because after all, these are small businesses that are running a quilting shop or a parking lot or something like that where they are not IT professionals, right? So to your question, just to, to frame that up, if I was forced with this, you know, I had a customer come to me, hey, I don't have this, I don't have this, I don't have this. My first question is, what is your business? And what is it that is most critical to you? And the analogy I would use here is, do you drive to work? And I'm assuming that most people drive to work <laughs> or have driven to work. And, and I will ask them the question, do you have auto insurance? And the answer is probably yes. So in this context of data and data protection and looking at outdated technology that I don't know how to manage, I said, okay, you are, you are sitting here looking at your car and you're going to drive to work. And what happens if on your way to work, it is totaled or someone crashes it? You're not going to worry about it because you have that insurance. The same thing is going to be true with the, the questions you just posed to me. So, hey, I have outdated technology. Well, outdated technology means I can get ransomware or malware infections much easier because there are zero day impacts that can be exploited. Um, I can be subject to, uh, if, if this truly is a sole point of failure uh, in terms of where the data lives, natural disaster or hard drive failures can take it out. So if your technology is dated, if you are not in a position to do that, then I have to look at what it is it that you're doing. Um, are you, what is your business and what is that data? And can you afford for that data to disappear? Or can you afford for the data operations to disappear while you reconstruct it and recraft it? And if you can't, which I suspect many small businesses cannot, then you need to talk to an MSP, managed service provider, someone to help you with these IT decisions, to help you suss out what is it that you can afford that at least gets you some level of protection. So coming back to this example, I need auto insurance. I might not need the best and lowest deductible and the highest coverage amount, but I need something to cover me in case of that disaster. And it's not just any coverage, I need specific things. So a specific insurance plan is going to be best for me. So the guidance I would give to that SMB um, or even a mid-sized business that has not enough IT resources or not the right skills to, to cover that, go get some help because you cannot afford to be a day or two or three without having your business operate, especially if you're that small business. Changes if we move up the stream because mid-market companies and enterprises have more resources and different things at their disposal. But I think that's the real cost that, that in, gets incurred if we think about this as losing your way to work or losing your house in the case of home insurance. Um, before we wrap up on the episode today, I want to ask you two more burning questions that, that I have. So as I prepared for this conversation, one thing that I loved about your LinkedIn bio was it talked about you're an advocate of efficient processes, effective use of resources, delighted customers, happy employees, exceptional results, and unrestrained creativity. Can you just briefly share what does that mean to you? Sure. Those are, um, those are tenants that I, I, I manage myself with, but it really boils down to kind of three things, people, processes, and product. In, in the first couple things, effective uses of resources and processes, that's clearly process. And, and that's an internal focused thing. Um, the product, you know, delighting customers, uh, having exceptional results, 
companies sell products, they sell services, they make things happen, um, they add value to people's lives, and they're able to charge for that. That's the product piece. And what binds them both together is the people aspect, right? So people process and product all being bound together is one thing. And that's what moves then how you even approach a business managing the business. And uh, if I were to extend this then to our subject today, how we think then about your business and how it needs to be protected. Awesome. I r- really appreciate that. And what made it stand out for me is I don't, ne- I've really honestly never heard a technology leader uh, talk about delighted clients and happy employees. <laughs> it's just, you don't hear that language. So I was like, you, I can't wait to be right. It's, 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 it's true. And, and <laughs> just to, just to kind of bolt onto that for a second is Look, there's there's different tenants out there and, and different practices, and, and every business school reviews Southwest Airlines for having the same uh, view of their customers as they do their employees. Like there's there's a lot of resources and and research out there about that. But if you're truly focused on your customer needs mm-hmm. and your people, meaning your employees, your team, whoever is producing the product or services are bought into that. And and I don't want to go as far as necessarily every company having a great mission statement or value, but if they're bought into that, then they find the right processes to be, and to deliver that product and service the right way. So these, all three of these things do, if you're operating properly, kind of complement each other um, to, to make all of the synergy happen. Yeah. I love that. Well, thank you for that. Last question for you before we wrap up. Um, you know, we've been talking a bit about, you know, operations, people. So I want to go back to some of the uh, discussion on technology. What does the future um, look like for cloud-based data protection? Oh, that's such a big question. Um, (laughs) So when I tackle that question, Right. I think about uh, you. You're, um, you s- said exactly data protection. Let me let me define that a little bit to back up in disaster recovery and, and at least that realm of data protection. Data and processes that act on data still exist to a great extent on premises. Um, small businesses that have not done their digital transformation and moved to the cloud. There's still a lot of data sitting about there in data centers that are subject to really bad things that can happen because they're running their operations, they're running their IT, they're running their security. Now, for those companies that have done digital transformation, the second place all this data lives is in the cloud and bravo for for making that leap. But cloud providers and SaaS providers don't always give you the things you need. By default, just because you're in the cloud does not mean it's backed up, does not mean you have retention, does not mean you have protection from ransomware, et cetera. It means you're in the cloud. Bravo, you're somewhere else, but you may not be protected. And then as I take the future element of this question, we're going to be on the edge, right? So this is uh, here in pandemic times, we've just seen the great migration of everyone to working from home. We've moved computation, or we've at least moved their laptops from the office environment to the home environment. But beyond that, we're looking at... um, and again, it's going to be companies that we're working about, but not people, is thinking about IoT devices, right? And and the devices that are now, almost every device is a data storage device and a data computation device. And those devices get smarter and smarter, and they're going to have more and more critical information that needs to be protected. And now I'll go beyond backup and disaster recovery. We talk about encryption and we talk about zero trust um, and, and all of the other fun things that happen in that realm. Those three things, three areas where data lives or processes live, three places where things can go wrong, all the more reason that if you're looking at a cloud strategy for data protection, that you need to look at it holistically. So the trending there, data is going to get more distributed. Data is going to get more decentralized. And Cloud providers will start providing more and give you more bang for your buck and and hear the cries of businesses and MSPs and bars and systems integrators to build more. Um, And they will, but it will never be everything that you need. So make sure you find the right, coming back to my original analogy, find the right insurance policy to protect the data that is most critical to you. Awesome. You've been a wealth of knowledge with us today. One last question. How 
listeners find you? Well, you can find Infrascale at infrascale.com, I-N-F-R-A-S-C-A-L-E.com. Thank you for listening to the Business Resilience Decoded podcast, brought to you by Asphalus Advisors and Disaster Recovery Journal. Make sure you check out the show notes for this episode to see all the upcoming events, programs, and ways we can support you. Make sure you subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts, leave us a review, and share it with a friend. Thanks again, and I'll talk to you in the next episode.